Two rocks. Hey, 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 hey. Now then, Graham, you, you, you'll like just have to remind me. How do I see what people are saying on here? So I'll wait, just wait a minute. I've just pinned it to my profile. So what people have to do if they want to comment is they need to click on my link, which is in my oh, pinned to my profile. Is it pinned yeah. to the primary rocks one as well, Gaz? It will be when I uh, pin it from yours. Right, lovely. So I'm just uh, searching up at Graham Andre now as I speak. Fantastic. There we go. Two tweets in the last hour. <laughs> oh, look at this. I'm watching myself live. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and then if people click on that link, then they can start to comment uh, in the bar next to our presentation. And join in. A bit like Excellent. this. There you go. Look. Can you see it? I can't see it, but um, that's all right, isn't it? Yes, Gray, I can see. Hi, all. I can't Lovely. see the bit at the bottom, though, but never mind. That, I'm sure that'll be fine. Yeah. Okay, so we're ready. There's, we're people, there's, the numbers are going up. They're flying up already. Are they flooding in, Graham? They're flooding yeah. in. <laughs> We've got 30 viewers, I can see. Uh, there Ooh. we go. I'm, I'm on it now. I'm on it. You're on it. 62, 64. Go for it. Go on in. Are you going to do some presentation here then, guys? Are you just going to sit watching the viewers going up? <laughs> no, well, actually, I've just confused myself because I've just clicked on the sound on the, on your uh, pin tweet, and I'm hearing myself from about 10 seconds ago. <laughs> so it's all a little bit strange. I'm new to this. I'm not a dab hand like you are. Well, you uh, know. Well, welcome, everyone, to uh, Primary Rocks. Uh, it's... Uh, it's eight o'clock just gone uh, by my my watch. So uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, a, a special thanks to Maddie Barnes. She is uh, a, an expert in the field of English. <laughs> now she's been to our school and she's done some training at our school, and it was it was absolutely fantastic. The worst thing about Maddie though is that uh, when I when I went on a training, I ended up emptying my bank account because she shared so many brilliant books. Um, so if if you if you've got an Amazon account, it might I, I haven't seen tonight's presentation, but I expect that it might be um, hammered by no, the end not. of the night. It's not. Is it not? Oh, even better, even better. So you're gonna you're gonna get free CPD, and your Amazon account isn't gonna be hammered. So uh, welcome, and a, a very special thank you to uh, the ever wonderful Graham Andre. Uh, he's a dab hand at this uh, stream yard now, and he's he's just given us a bit of a crash course backstage um, on how this all runs. Um, you might have seen him on a Saturday morning drinking ciders and uh, hosting CPD <laughs> over the last few weeks. You might have seen him on a Saturday morning drinking ciders <laughs> just on a bench in the, the Isle of Wight <laughs> previously. Right, yeah. um, but now he's now he's doing it online uh, and sharing some fantastic CPD as well. So uh, a massive thank you to to Graham and Maddie. Um, Graham loved the uh, loved the tunes uh, pre primary rocks question tonight. That was uh, that was great. Uh, the, yeah, the entrance theme. What would your entrance theme have been, Graham? What did you? What was uh, yours? I you put, it was uh, Frank Stallone, Far From Over, which is from Staying Alive. <laughs> nice, yeah. like it. How about you, Maddie? I was going to have Eye of the Tiger. Oh, oh, yeah. So there we go. So we got uh, two, two, two. Uh, what about you? There. I, mine was Stone Cold Steve Austin. Oh yeah. You know, from the nineties, <laughs> yeah. the glass smashing. You know that a, a can's going to be opened. Uh, when, when that comes on so um i'll uh, i'll stop chatting now uh say thank you to everyone for joining in everyone who's joined in uh, just a massive thanks as always primary rocks is nothing without you lot uh, coming along and and joining in and sharing so it's a treat tonight to say uh thank you to to maddie and uh maddie over to you wait a minute guys wait a minute What's going to oh. happen? Do you want to tell them about what's happening? Oh. So Maddie's going to do a presentation. Maddie's yeah? going to do. Thanks, Graham. I see. This is <laughs> this is why this is why you're this is why you're here. Uh, Maddie's going to do a presentation. If you've got any questions, just pop them in the chat down the side. Uh, me and Graham are going to monitor the chat uh, and see. Um, see any questions that come up and at the end uh, we'll have a, a bit of a question and answers with maddie is that right graham yeah that sounds good guys well have, have I missed anything else off <laughs> any, any about where the toilets are if there's a the fire uh, alarm or... <laughs> yeah make sure you wash your hands every every hour um yeah. stay safe uh, stay two meters yeah. away from each other uh un unless you've got you know mitigation on uh, you know. <clears throat> i'll stop maddie yeah. thanks over to you 
Hi, everybody. Um, just wanted to make it clear that the PowerPoint will be able to be downloaded at some point on Google Drive or something. So if you're an English subject lead and you want to use this PowerPoint, please do. Um, I've credited a few slides to a few different people. So please just credit those people so it, it's all fair. So um, tonight came about just because I wanted to do uh, some free CPD and I was initially doing it to donate some money to Chester Zoo. So if anybody can do that, that would be amazing. Um, and Gaz very kindly offered me the slot. So a massive thanks to him. And I hadn't typed Graham's name in. So massive thanks to him because he's got me on here. Um, so as I said, I will share the, the link to donate to Chester Zoo because that's kind of why I was doing the free CPD. So life after lockdown might be preempting that a bit since we're not quite out. But um, I think as English subject leads, we're going to have some challenging times ahead um, in terms of how we're going to manage and monitor English, considering the latest news has been that we're going to be doing a lot more of English and maths. Um, so I just wanted to kind of recognise that it's shifting sands time again. And um, we've been there before and we've been all right. So it, it's kind of a little bit about... Um, common sense I just wanted to, to share some free things with you and some of my thought processes and one of them being um everybody's asking what are the priorities going to be and what have the children missed and one of my favorite things is keep calm and remember you're doing a great job so a big part of that is we've seen these slogans banging around so you know catch up you know the bloke with the clock bounce back close the gap they, they all seem to be banging around and, um, you know, get Gavin Williamson's using them a bit. Um, and I, I went on some really good training a couple of Saturdays ago with Alex Quigley, a webinar, and he, and he had some really interesting thoughts about, do we want to bounce back to March 2020 or is it that we want to go forward to 2021? And, you know, what does catch up really mean and what gaps are we closing? So I think if you were going to do this with your staff on a Zoom or something, that slide might have a little bit more discussion. But I've asked Alex if I can share this slide and he's given me permission. If you can't see it properly, I'm not going to read every slide to you, but I just thought this was re a really good grounding way of thinking about what are we going to do in September, particularly for English, obviously other subjects. But I really like the idea of um, what are we going to start doing, what are we going to stop doing, what are we going to do more of, what are we going to do less of, and what are we going to keep doing but do differently. And um, I guess that that slide could last 45 minutes, but I haven't, I can't see any of you. I would love to be able to chat to you all about that. Um, but I think you can probably do that in your setting. And I think that would be a really interesting way of starting off with, you know, what are the priorities for English, for reading, for writing? Um, what might we need to do more of? Hopefully that's reading and talking. And um, what are we going to do less of? Well, I'm not going to suggest in there, but I'm sure you've all got your own ideas of what you'll pencil in that box. And the keep doing, but doing it differently, I can imagine will be quite a, a full box. So Alex Quigley's given permission for us to share this slide. I really think it will be uh, pivotal. But in all honesty, I think it's just going to come down to teaching um, and good quality teaching is, is what we need to do. And I know that all of us can do that. So the shifting sands are there and everybody's asking us about how we're going to start. Do we start with a bridging unit? You know, are we going back with reading? Are we doing spring or summer assessments? How are we going to inform the parents in the autumn term, parents evening if there even is one? And it's all going to come down to, as English leads, let's just make sure that the children are getting a really good diet of teaching. Um, for me, it's always been hard to spin all of the English plates. I know lots of you have been on training will have seen a couple of these slides, but I just put them in as home comforts um, because it isn't actually starting from fresh. You know, I'm going to say this and I'm sorry if it's controversial, but I've worked in lots of schools. I've worked in schools where children might not have had a good term in terms of they may have had um, not great teaching due to many issues and they've been all right. It's just that the whole school seemed to be in the same situation, but they'll be all right. Um, spinning all of the plates is going to be difficult. So it might be that you choose one to focus on for autumn. And I was just thinking it's worth reminding all our staff about the reading and writing journey. Um, and that they are the national curriculum. It's not that we have to try and cram anything different in. It's just that we're going to 
do our reading with an amazing text, do the skills of comprehension and analysis, sort out a piece of writing that's linked to that, hopefully, so they've got a, what a good one looks like, do the planning, however you do it. Um, the draft, write, evaluate, edit, proofread process is going to be down to your school, but we just need to make sure it's going to be scaffolded. We're going to need, we always review old learning in autumn. Everybody spends autumn term backpedaling to the summer. Um, it's not that we've got to backpedal further. It's just that we need to go in, hitting the ground running with great teaching. And for me, the whole school journey has never been more important than September 2020. You are all well and truly in it together. And I always share this slide, so I can't do it tonight without it. You know, they are the team that I would have loved to have been in. I'm sure they wouldn't have let me. But if I had to be in a team, I'd be with Cool Runnings. There's four of them. I always talk about that being nursery reception year one and year two. And that is a team. And then we've got year three, four, year five, six in the other team. And a great team is all four year groups doing an amazing job or doing a good job will make a great team. And that quote there actually comes from um, our Ofsted report at my last school, where I got into a bit of a fix with the inspector because she asked me why we didn't have any great adept pupil premium writers. And instead of answering her, I told her that we use the motto of we're all in it together with the cool runnings bobsleigh team. And it ended up creeping into the report. So to me, that is the slide I would spend some time on with my uh, team if I was back in a school and just talking about um, we've got to do consistent approach to teaching reading, consistent approach to teaching writing. And as English leads, that's much easier to manage if we're looking at something similar, not, not that we're taking personalities away because nobody wants their wings clipping and being told they've got to all read a script, but that we've got some consistent, not non-negotiables, but you all know what I mean, some framework that works for your school. So in terms of where we start, I think we all know it's a high quality text. I, I love that quote from Dumbledore. We must all face the choice between what's right and what's easy. Um, I don't think teachers ever go the easy way, but I think we will be umming and ahhing about what's right for September. And what I would say is, you know your children, and children are going to need to talk. Um, lots of them might have a perception of what's gone on. We don't know what it's been like for them. Um, so we need a high quality text that's going to allow them to talk, not necessarily about what's gone on in lockdown, but a text that's going to give them a voice. Because we all know if they have something to say, then they've got something to write. Um, an engaging text that's motivating. It might be a new one. You might be looking for something new. It might not be all right to use the one that you use every autumn because it might not be sensitive. And by that, I mean, I know lots of schools do World War II. I, I don't think it's going to be a good idea to go straight into September talking about evacuation in history when the kids have just had lockdown. So we, we might just need to be a bit sensitive to approaches um, and, and texts that staff are familiar with or that they can get familiar with before September. So. The choice of text is going to be huge. Once we've got that sorted, if, if, you, if you're stuck, Madeline Lindley's the place to be. I've put in some of the things that they offer and their details. They are open. And if you go there genuinely and say, I want a book about a panda who's a hero, they'll find it. Even if you say it's got to be a graphic novel for year three. So they will find whatever you want. So I just wanted to, to mention them. And then once we've got that text, it's going to be the reading skills. And I've just put together a list of skills that I think are absolutely uh, pivotal for teaching reading. Obviously, a text that's got some challenging vocabulary, um, varying how we ask the kids questions. That summary of, do you really know what I've just read to you? Can you tell me? Can you write a hashtag to summarise what I've just read? You know, can you tell your mate if they weren't here tomorrow what that story was about? And for me, the one, two, three, one, two, three, four, fifth bullet point, I think, is massive. You know, we do need to have progression over the year of um, what texts are offered. But the autumn text shouldn't be as challenging as the spring. You know, we should be able to see that there's progression across the academic year. Um, the variety of the text is huge. We want to build confident readers. And then thinking about what your diet's like. So... What is the diet of literature like at your school? You know, are you providing children with options to be able to read high quality? And this slide is by no means to cause offence. I always use it on training. All of those shops are amazing and they all have their place. And we all go to those shops for specific things. So you probably don't do a weekly shopping waitrose. 
Um, you might just pop in there for bread. Well, I don't. I might just pop in for bread. Um, but what I'm saying here is that if you did buy a loaf of bread from all of those shops, that's, that same loaf of bread would cost a different price across that spectrum of shops. And all I'm saying there is if you put your fiction, nonfiction and poetry together, would there be a disparity between the quality or are they all of a similar quality? And um, what I quite often find if schools ask me to audit is that their fiction is like Waitrose quality. Their nonfiction is, you know, Morrison's, Asda. And then their poetry, sadly, is, you know, Little and Aldi. And I, as I said before, I'm not being classist here. Little and Aldi are amazing. They just make me spend loads of money on like a tent and a halogen lamp that I don't need or a foam roller ma massaging thing. So they all have their place. But this is the time to be thinking about have we got that range of quality or have we got a consistent approach? So one of the skills that I think children are going to need a, a big recap in is skimming and scanning. I know that lots of people have seen me share this slide before and I know that Shireen did this on her vocab training. Just some resources that will help children to skim and scan. Um, obviously, the great fairy tale search and where's the pair? Any Britta books is early year, key stage one. Whereas when we move in into key stage two, where's emoji? Um, I've just put up a slide there. That's a where's emoji skimming and scanning activity. Don't worry, the answers are at the back of the book. But we might just need to do a little bit of this with our even our key stage two readers, because it might be that they've not been so ob their observation skills might not be so finely tuned after spending some time at home alex quigley had some amazing statistics about the amount of kids who've got a book at home and i think it was um one in eight pupil premium children so just just to be mindful that they might need sharpening those um skimming and scanning and i've just put some other activities in that can help train their eyes um and again progression with find and copy i know it's the bane of our life and we don't just do it for sats it's about making children really understand vocabulary so for me, find and copy or find and point in key stage one year, one early years is more about um, has the child understood what the vocab means rather than can they get a mark in a SAT. So this slide as English subject leads and anyone who's interested in English, um, I think most schools have got high quality text on the menu. And I would, I would say that many schools are asking high quality questions. The bit that I don't always see a lot of and a bit that English subject leads ask me for help with is high quality model dances. And it's we, we always do a, what a good one looks like in writing. Um, but I'm not sure that we always spend enough time with what a good one looks like in reading. So if we're asking children, you know, what impression do you get of a character? I, I know we have to model it on the board so that they can see us do it. Um, so, so that would be the final rung on the ladder that gets them up to that amazing place of reading. And, and that's where we want all children to be, that when they're reading, they've got the gist of it and they could do it. Um, so that slide, I think, is quite insignificant. If, if you're only going to get one of the 48, take that one. Um, this one I've shared before, but for anyone who hasn't heard me talk about reading, um, this was a little bit of a research that I did in a school that I was working at in Salford. Um, where I asked the children that question from the King Midas sat, um, where they had to write in roll. Do you remember those amazing questions they used to have pre-2016 where they had the speech bubble and they had to pretend, pretend to be Midas when he realised he'd done that. Now, I'm sorry I didn't mean it was a year one. OMG, I'm devoured was a year three. And then the next answer was a year five. And then the final one was quite an irritating year six who wrote in the style of the myth. So what I'm saying there is... Um, all the children could access the question because I read the text, but you can see if there was progression in how they've understood it as a reader, we would probably prefer, I regret my actions to OMG, I'm devoured. So all I'm saying here is all those children would have got the mark, but we can see a difference in how they've articulated their reading response. Um, grammar in a context, obviously that's a given that children will make connections. We don't want children churning out fronted adverbials for the sake of it, but we want them to be able to say, oh, there's Roald Dahl, he's used a fronted adverbial and this is why. And, and I think it's really important that we plug that in September because we're not going to be able to fill every single objective from the last few years. So we're going to have to maximise contextual grammar. Um, 
And just to kind of give a little nod to Shireen, who I know lots of you follow on Twitter, but her analysis of the 2019 paper basically just supports that um, bobsleigh team of, of cool run-ins that we, we all play our part in it. So we need to make it as contextual and meaningful as we can so that the children can make those links because we can't possibly fill all of those gaps. Um, planning that first unit, you know, what what first unit are we going to do? I wish I could talk to people or let them chat, but because it's um, virtual, I can't do it. Um, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, you'll have some great first units. You might have to tweak it. Um, and you don't know what you're getting coming through the door in September. You might get some great surprises. But if you've got a great text that you can read for meaning and you can scaffold the reading and scaffold the writing and it provides incidental rights and allows you to proofread and edit, go with it. So something I wanted just to plug is I reckon children are going to need loads of proofreading reminders because they might not have been checking much work that they've been doing. So the proofreading hand has really worked for me and a lot of the schools I work with in that the children just do one finger at a time. So I'm just checking my grammar or I'm just checking my punctuation. In early years, having a massive one and saying, right, we're going to move across each finger and make sure that our one sentence that we've written makes sense. Have we got our capital? So I don't need to teach you to suck eggs, but the proofreading hand has been really successful in, in many schools all the way up to year six. Um, and again, as an English lead, you monitoring have the children written for a range of purposes and audiences. Um, I've put down the left the main purposes and obviously down the right loads of different forms of writing. And something that's going to be really important um, is basically talking to them about purpose and audience, because that might not be something we could get across with home learning. Um, this is a, a way that I record when I do a book scrutiny or a book look. Um, I've put a year two, three version of George's Marvelous Medicine and a year five, six one, where if we jot down the tasks and what the purpose is, what we can see here is that they've written for different purposes. The biggest um, problem when, you, when you're doing a coverage check as an English lead is you might find that the teachers have, have taught a diary, a letter, a narrative, a leaflet um, and a recount of a trip and then... When you look into it, the diary was a recount, the letter is a recount, the narrative was a recount, the recount of the trip was a recount, and the leaflet was a recount, or the newspaper. So, And, and that can be soul-destroying for a teacher because they've taught five or six different forms of writing, but the purpose was the same, or sometimes there's an over-description. So if people are planning their first unit like this, they'll see really clearly, oh, yeah, I've got a few different purposes going on. Um, now, you might not want to do that many purposes in autumn one because you might be just doing basic skills and any incidental writing might be what you need. When we're talking about the writing process, we can't get away from what, what we used to teach as. You know, I know it's not it's not um, delivered like this in the exemplification, but at the end of the day, we need to give them the skills of sentence structure and punctuation. We need to teach them what coherence and cohesion means for text structure. And basically, composition and effect is if you've got a great task, that's half your oomph. And the other half is their personality and letting them have that ownership of the writing. So, um, you know, you're doing Macbeth in year six and you say, right, anyone's diary rather than everybody do Macbeth. So let's give them some ownership. Um, and when I was in Salford in year four doing that, a kid wrote the diary of the dagger and he wasn't great at depth. He was a good, he was a good expected kid, but I would never have put the dagger up as a choice. And um, the same when I was doing year one with the Queen's Hat, um, Steve Anthony book, when I said you can either be the queen or the, or the hat or the corgi. And a kid wrote as the wind. And I'll never forget reading it because he wrote, um, I blow your candles out on your birthday cake. I knock the cards off the uh, mantelpiece. I dry the washing and I nick the queen's hat off her head. And it was brilliant. You know, there was loads of oomph in it. His sentence structure punctuation wasn't always there, but his composition effect was in abundance. And we'd all rather a class of that, you know, so that if you haven't got that, the high quality text will give you that. And I just want to pay a little bit of a note to Martin Galway. He's um, He works for Hearts for Learning. That's his Twitter tag. I put Shireen's on as well because it's their slide. If you haven't used this slide or if you haven't talked to Martin about 
talking to the children about how formal do you have to be in this piece of writing. So let's put our vocab, grammar and punctuation to match the occasion and, and moving away from it being posh, like not, we're not putting on our posh voice. We need to put on our formal tone. I had a really interesting conversation with some year fives in Liverpool um, the week of lockdown. And we were talking about formal writing. And um, I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this. So sorry, Graeme, if you have to cut it. But um, I said, who, who would be in the tuxedo? You know, who do you know as an audience who would be that formal? And one of the boys said the prime minister. And, and this little lad at the back of the room in the middle of uh, Liverpool said, well, he's not really formal, is he? Because he hides in a fridge. And, and and we couldn't stop laughing, me and the teacher. And we were like, well, who else could be a formal audience? And it, it was it was out of the mouth of him, really, because he's, he's seen a perception of a person and thought, is he formal? Um, so it was really honest. And, and we then agreed that we were going to write to the mayor of Liverpool. They all agreed. Somebody wrote to Klopp. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure why, but someone wrote to Klopp in a formal tone. But... To chat to Martin about that. I know he's got some new blogs coming up um, on Hearts for Learning, but have a chat about that. Um, now, this little bit here, part of this came from the Alex Quigley webinar. And, um, you know, as English subject leads, are we asking our teachers to do formal assessments in autumn on reading and writing and grammar? You know, um, do we want to assess in early autumn? We know there's going to be lost learning and we know we've got to intervene to address it. We know there's learning that hasn't been embedded because they finished in March, lots of them. Um, what purpose will that hard data give you? Um, would day-to-day -day teaching highlight your gaps or soft data like checking the reading the reading books that they're on, particularly lower down the school with early readings, checking if, if the right reading book, if they're on the right band? Um, is, is reviewing and teaching going to be more have more impact on progress than spending a week doing spring assessments that will probably tell us that we've got lost learning. So I know it might not be your decision there, but just thinking about if there's a purpose for it or will soft data give you more? Um, and, and that teaching the proofreading and editing skills so that actually what we're assessing is the best that they can do. Um, by the end of the autumn term, I think we can assess them what we've taught and we can comp we've compensated. We will have made up significant gaps and probably ready for standardizing data. Now, obviously, that's just up for discussion, but um, we know they've lost learning. We know that the, some of the learning won't have been embedded, but we what will a formal test tell us any more than that? So um, I, I've just stuck that in there for a bit of a, a bit of a discussion. Okay, COVID recovery. Um, I've just put together a few questions that I know I've been asking schools that I work with. You know, um, the bullet point two, will pupils be able to take reading books home in September? We're not sure about that. Are they going to be able to bring books home and bring them back in? And how are your parents going to support reading if they can't send the books home? So those two to me are really important, which is I've got something coming up on the next few slides, which might support you with that. And this reading for pleasure, and Alex quickly really tuned into this, and it really hit a nerve with me that in order to read for pleasure, you've got to be a fluent reader. So not all children will read for pleasure. And it's about making sure that they're fluent so they can read for pleasure and that they hear us reading so that they hear reading that is pleasure. So how will you manage English along with everything else? Um, I've been doing some work for the BBC over lockdown and I've been doing the big read and the book club lessons. That's what they look like on the daily lessons. There's only one a week and it's where celebrities have read extracts from books and there's some reading lessons. Now, if you've not accessed them, the big read is year seven, eight, nine. Book club is year one to six. Um, and the big read is, uh, theirs is purple and key stage one and two is orange. If you've not accessed them, the quality of the texts are really good. They've got some really amazing people reading them. Stephen Fry, uh, Joanna Lumley. They've got loads of great people. And actually, you could direct some teachers there just to get a couple of reading sessions. That's what the Key Stage 1 looks like. That's Ashley Roberts reading Cake by Sue Hendra. Um, so you can just click on the lesson and there's two clips and then there's like, reading questions like that next to them. That's a Year 6 one. Um, the Wolves of Willoughby Chase, and that's a year six reading question. So, you know, it's a free resource. It's there. There's 12 weeks of lessons. So there's 12 reading lessons for every year group. 
Um, also, now this, I can't, I'm not going to attempt to try and click into my, um, I was going to show you around the website, but I'm not even going to attempt it. I'll do a little mini one and put it on the YouTube channel of this. Um, Rising Stars have got a three-month free subscription to both of these. Now, Rising Stars Reading Planet, if you haven't been on that, get the subscription, but you might want to save it till around August. So you've got it for the three months. Hopefully, they'll extend it. So basically, if you can't send, send reading books home, the children will have access all the way from pre-lilac up to dark navy or whatever it is for year six. And the books are really good quality. And they also come with, with parents and teachers notes. Cracking comprehension goes from year one all the way up to year six. And it looks just like it is there on the screen. Um, it, it's put in as a quiz. But that will be great for parents for home learning if they've got online access. I know that's a massive if for lots of us. Um, but but they are free and there's no um, hidden agenda small print. So if you've already signed up to it in March and you're thinking, oh, my God, I've, I've already had the free one and we've never used it because we just didn't get around to it. I'm sure they'll extend it and um, email them and say you've been on some training that made it sound amazing. Um, I've put there how, how you can use them. Um, I don't often recommend things unless I think they're really good. So I don't work with them on the, I know I work with Rising Stars on other products, but I don't work with these, but I do think they're amazing quality. <clears throat> and they've got fiction, nonfiction and poetry. Um, so have a look through that, because that will be a really good way of your parents reading at home with the children online. Uh, I couldn't help putting in the here's one I made earlier, just because there are units out there that are already written. Um, Lanks have done some bridging units. So I've, they're 30 quid each. Um, I've just put in a few samples of, of what they're doing. So a bridging unit from one year group to the next. So Lanks have done it. That's their contact details if you're interested in those. Rising Stars have done the reading to writing units. They're £30 each. And I was going to show you around some of these, but I, I just don't want to risk the uh, tech. Graham might tell me later how to do it. Um, but basically, you get the PowerPoint with all the teaching slides. Um, you get the planning that you can edit as a Word document. Um, have a look. Obviously, they're not free, the £30. But if you're looking for an additional unit to slot into your pre-autumn, have a look into those. Um, and CPD in the Northwest, obviously, is where I do a lot of it if you're interested in coming on any training. Um I've raced through that because I want the Q&A bit. I want um, Graham and uh, Gaz to have a little bit of a slot here because I've noticed some questions coming up. Um, what I would say is I've worked with amazing English subject leads over the last few years as an English subject lead myself. Um, hopefully you can um, network with someone on Primary Rocks. Um, keep your head about it because we, we all know how to teach reading. We all know that it's a high quality text and we teach the children to get the general gist of it and once we've got that engagement we can generate those writing outcomes we might have to do a lot more scaffolding i can't imagine anyone's going to want an observation in autumn one anyway i've heard that offset is staying clear for autumn term so it's going to be about um high quality teaching i know i always end on that image there of um somebody racing into the mouth of something not quite great I always say on training, that is a little bit like a Monday morning in school, but just make sure you get out the other side on a Friday. Um, obviously, Primary Rocks is a great place to um, to share, and CPD of Primary Rocks is brilliant. So, you know, we're not at the end of the summer term yet. I know I'm kind of flicking forward to COVID recovery, but I just wanted to put together and signpost a few places where you could get resources. and. Um, basically just show a few different um ideas and reminding us to look for coverage reminding teachers to be smart you know we don't want seven recounts and two descriptions um the, the, the choice of text is going to be key and um if anybody can i'm going to bang on now about chester zoo for 20 seconds um i have i have set up a little bit of a link for chester zoo if anybody would like to donate something in turn for uh, some some CPD. I will definitely share the PowerPoint. So please, if you want to use it, it will be up there on a Google Drive somewhere once I, once I work out how to do it. I have got a YouTube channel, so it might be just easy for me to pop it on there. Um, but other than that, 
um, I think we can come back to Gaz and Graham if that's okay, and uh, and have some quite Q and A if they're if they're listening. I was really mm -hmm. tempted then. I was so tempted just to leave you there, Maddie, talking to yourself. Thanks, <laughs> Maddie. That was really good. Thank you very much. What we do, Mads, is I've got the um, PowerPoint. So if I stick it on a Google Drive or something and send out the link, or send it to Gaz and he can send it out under the primary rock thing there. Uh, and people can have that. It's real. Lots of really nice comments. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. just as yet. Oh, good, because I just had a bit of a nightmare. Um, uh, but I'm back. That's fine. Um, that was great, Maddie. Thanks a million for doing that. Um, I was. Uh, I've sent it to our English leader, and she was saying that this. One of the things that I think people like about the way you uh, present things is that it's just uh it seems like common sense it seems like stuff that is easy to do and it, it, it seems like somebody who is not giving um and i mean this in a dead positive way not giving yeah. really complicated ideas but but giving seemingly simple ideas but everybody knows that some of the hardest ideas to to implement effectively are the simplest ones so um it was great that there was loads of comments i've just got um, a few uh bits and bobs down here me personally, I love the Alex Quigley shape slide, you know, right yeah. at the very beginning. Yeah. I think that's uh, one that we're going to be using with our SLT. I thought that was fantastic. Um, and also what you said about uh, reading and writing and the journey being the key. It's not about, you know, the individual lessons. It's about looking at it as a whole. Um, how, do you go about, how, how do you go about doing that when you're not sure um, where the children are going to come back um, at in September? Well, I, I, I think it's going to just be all genuinely about the choice of text. And it's got to be a text that the teacher wants to do. I think I think that's going to be key. Because I don't think we can take a risk with a dodgy text. You know, we've all done that. I tried Alice in Wonderland in Salford. Lasted three chapters. I won't say live what I, what I was told. But the next day I did The Highwayman. I don't, I don't think we've got time to kind of not be making errors. But if we've got a unit that we know works, I think we just go in. If we're going to read it, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with the teacher scaffolding the reading for those first few weeks, and and then letting them pinch as much as they can from those high quality texts when they're writing. Um, but I genuinely think it's got to be a text that that they want to talk about. Yeah, so, and uh, I can uh, somebody else has put uh, old school Kensuke's Kingdom never fails. I, uh, some of my Michael Morpurgo stuff uh, is a bit. Um, boring for me uh, but kensuke's kingdom i love that one graham what are you thinking about doing in September? where where are you in september great are you in a class five. um i had a question actually mads linked to what you were talking about and to to covid really you talked about stamina you know stamina in writing and uh, i don't know about you but since we've come back what we found is the kids haven't got any yeah <laughs> uh, so they're finding it really difficult to stick at anything because they are just so so tired especially you know uh, as we go into the afternoons and things like that, we always need siestas and stuff. So, have you got any tips at all on rebuilding that stamina? A whole, a whole class siesta sounds quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, any strategy like the scaffolding ones, you know, the, the slow rights, anything like that might be helpful, you know, giving them a real structure to start them off with. Yeah. I think they probably just feel a bit out of the depth because they probably haven't done much writing, even the ones they've been in. As you say, you know, they've not got the stamina. So I would say really scaffolded, you know, those those plans that kind of box it up. Yeah. You know, like Corbett stuff as well. Um, any anything that's gonna give it once they see success in the writing, then I think they'll be it can take the stabilizers off the bike. But we might need to put them on for a bit. I don't think there's anything yeah. wrong with that. We did the um did you do the, the you know the National Writing Day last week, the twenty four seven challenge? Did you do yeah. that? Yeah, the kids really enjoyed that because, you know, 24 words and seven minutes to write a story. Um, but they really, really enjoyed that because, it, you know, there was no pressure on them for spelling or punctuation or anything else. It's just that that story. And I don't know, it's not stamina, but, you know, it's quite a nice, quite a nice yeah. thing. But I think, I think they've just got to see that they can do a bit of writing because even yeah. that consequences game, you remember that with the piece of paper where you write a sentence and pass it around the room? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, something like that might be funny. It's going to be daft. It's not going to get you any cohesion, coherence. But what it might do is make them want to write. 
Yeah. You know, I think I think we are going to have to go short and snappy. I know that yeah. defeats stamina, but I think it will in the end give them, Get them back into it. Yeah. yeah, that's what we've said as well. We've said that long pieces of writing are out the window for well, at least the first half term, and then we'll see where we're up to. Like you said, Maddie, st- short and snappy. Mads. Um, lots of people saying how much they enjoyed it, but uh, so the, the Chrissy T has been looking at Jane Considine resources. What do you think? I actually don't, I don't know Jane's work well enough to comment, to be honest. Sorry. I, th- I think right. Jane, Jane's really big on Twitter, isn't she? She's doing loads of um, training. So I'm sure she'd be able to answer any questions about her training, but I honestly don't know it well enough to, to comment. Sorry. That's all right. Mr. ACD, he talks about slow writing. Do you know anything about slow writing for those people that don't? Yeah, well, slow writing is giving them like a, almost a recipe. So, you know, Ty Corbett did the, you know, the stuff with the unifix where you do a noun, a noun with an adjective, a noun adjective determiner, a noun adjective determiner preposition. So the dog, the big dog, the big yeah. dog sat on the window for early years, two stage one. Slow writing is saying to them, your first sentence needs this, your second sentence needs this, your third sentence, a bit like Rob's, what is it, dad waivers, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. a bit like giving them a formula. Now, obviously, that's not independent to be moderated, but it will give them a formula. They'll find it easier once they, if they know what those things are. I think it's just like a recipe, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and I think with the, with slow writing, it's uh, it's when i've used it in class it's been you, you say that you're going to do a paragraph of six sentences and in the first sentence you've got to have an adjective the yeah. second sentence you've got to have a simile so there's a different thing for each sentence isn't there and it yeah. doesn't have to be the the say you know you could you could put a picture in front of them and then say you're right you're going to write these six sentences to describe this picture and the six sentences are, are, are going to be following this and it, it's a it's an assessment tool as well to see whether the kids can remember what an adjective after uh, after three months, well, five months off for some of them. Yeah, and I think that's the strategy, isn't it? And then obviously another another writing day to say, right, we're not going to give you a recipe, but if you can remember anything that we used, try and put yeah. them in your writing, then you can see application. That would be the real writing, wouldn't it? Yeah. We've got a T Gray primary here who says, uh, any good starter text for year four in uh, in September? Mm. picture book i'd go with um rock paper scissors love rock paper scissors it's an amazing book isn't it i bought it after being on one of your courses <laughs> I'd go with something like that because it's so funny isn't it like the voices you can yeah. do i'd go with something like that because you can get some you can really get audience and formality like the scissors is quite sultry isn't she whereas the rocks like just a rock but um <laughs> I'd go with something like that, or if you're going to go novel-wise, I'd go with one of Lisa Thompson's, either The Day I Was Erased or The Boy Who Fooled the World. They're really funny if you want to go in with a novel. Um, Something like Journey, Aaron Becker's Journey Without Any Words, if you want to give them a load of uh, pictures. I think our uh, Year 5s usually start with Tuesday as well. Oh, um, yeah. Because that's... uh, it's a great book, isn't it? And again, yeah. no words, and the kids can make of it what they want. And I think that'd work really well with slow writing. I think somebody's just put down here, it, slow writing, L Butterworth 6 says slow writing is great for getting them to think about uh, the effect each sentence has and, uh, and and really carefully choosing the words that they're going to put as well. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what that is? What's that? The shade shadeometer. I think that's, um, you know, like the scale of language where you can go from happy to ecstatic. I'm assuming that's what that person's referring to, where you do all the different, like happy doesn't mean ecstatic. Um, I know children sometimes think that happy is the same as ecstatic. And I always say on training, I know I probably say too much, but in terms of ecstatic, I've only been ecstatic in my life about five times. Once when City won the league, when I got married, I reckon giving birth, but I've not done it. But I've been happy in millions and millions. So it's it's that children understand that there's other words that come in the middle of the shadeometer. Right. So yeah. Things like sad and uh, crestfallen or desolate. So if they put the character like Graham was desolate, well he wasn't desolate. It's just there was no pizza left. He was sad. So it's that they you know because what really does crestfallen mean? Kids have got it on a shadeometer, but I hope never to be crestfallen in my life. 
but some of them stick it in like the highway route was crestfallen but he wasn't crestfallen he was just sad just a bit glum yeah, yeah and i've seen them put on the b and b and q uh paints yeah yeah and I th is that why they call shade on meters i think so yeah okay. like just so they understand that they yeah. they're not synonyms don't mean the same they mean similar same yeah. as small isn't it when they think you know they go to the synonym circle and pick out the word minuscule about a squirrel well you can't really have a minuscule squirrel it's just going to be small isn't it yeah. i think you're down there as well uh, L Butterworth six again, saying that they use uh, mood graphs, yeah, and I think that will be ideal for coming back and talking about, you know, what what kids have been through over the last uh, over the last three months or so. Um, and I think that's important to talk about. Um, any books on um, opening up your feelings, sharing what's inside, because I, I think I also think we've got to be careful that some kids won't think won't think that they've been through anything bad. Yeah. Um, my two lads have, have quite enjoyed being off school and doing <laughs> and doing online learning. Uh, uh, they've taken a flexi approach to learning, um, <laughs> and, and I know that some some other children may may be feeling may be feeling the same. Any books for sharing feelings, that kind of thing, Maddie? I know Dawn Robertson. I think she's watching. She's done a whole pack of them. I know she'd be happy to share that. Um, yeah. You know, there's loads of them. Kind of Think off the top of my head, all the uh, No Outsiders in Our School books will do that. Andrew's uh, book list will do it. Something really simple like YouTube with um, the youngest ones will be really helpful. But there's, there's loads of books out there. I, I'm, I would like to, to think, a question that I thought of is, will children's empathy be the same? Mm -hmm. You know, are, they, is, are their empathy still going to be different? Do, do you know what I mean? I'm wondering whether... It, inference will be stronger or you know will they be able to I, I don't know it might be interesting piece of research yeah, it might be that it, sorry go oh, on guys carry you, you carry on no i was just going to say i think it might be uh the kids might come back with more empathy because yeah. of the way that they've got to the, the way that they've got to be with each other and the, the you know the the clapping for carers and and thinking that people have, have sacrificed so much just for for them to stay safe. I think it would be a really interesting one. I agree. I agree. <laughs> What's going on there, Ed, Matt? What's going on in your house? No, it's not me. It's, it's Gaz. I haven't got a dog. Right. Sorry, is that is that is that somebody squeaking uh, squeaking a thing for me, new dog? Sorry. <laughs> Sounds like a party's going on, Gaz. Oh, I, well, it is. Well. The dog, the dog's just going out for uh, for for a visit. I'll just mute myself for a moment. Can you see the question that um, I've put up on the screen? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I think, I, think it's, I don't know if Mr. Book Primary is referring to grammar, or um, I'm, I'm assuming he might be referring to grammar terminology there with subject knowledge. What the book that I would recommend was Joe Shackleton's. Um, Joe Shackleton's Grammar Survival Kit, or whatever it's called. It's it's an orange front cover. It's really decent, and so is obviously Sue Palmer's Skeleton for Grammar. I'd go simple. I wouldn't go to David Crystal because it's too hard. Um, keep it simple. So the Joe Shackleton book has got one side in, inside of... If a child asks you, it's before a conjunction or a preposition, that book will tell you. Because I think it's those sorts of questions that we might need to be prepared for. Um, and there's and there's no harm in looking in her book. I've always got it in my laptop bag, but it's not for me. But it is an orange cover grammar survival kit for primary teachers or something toolkit. I'd go with that. And yeah. it, I, hopefully, staff aren't offended if you put a copy of it on the table. He's got there's some good questions, old Mister Butts, if that's his name. <laughs> I like his picture. Yeah, I do. Oh, yeah. Do we build in pioneer group statements? Well, I think we all do that in autumn anyway. Yeah. We, we do spend autumn backpedalling, even yeah. if you carry the same class up with you. I know. That's one of the frustrating things about teaching, isn't it? Sometimes you know that kids have covered an objective and when you go to teach it and they don't, they can't remember a thing about it. You're like, oh. And when, yeah, you're, the one, when you're the one who carried them up, because that was what happened to me when I took my year fives up. I got out of year six for one year 
And then we got went in year five, and then I went back in year six. She told me in the May holiday you should be keeping them. Um, and when I got them back in year six, I was like, we did this. And they were like, no, we didn't. And when you're the one that had them, <laughs> it's so easy to look across the corridor and think, yeah, I know we never did it. But when it was you, it's yeah. still as frustrating. So I think Mr. Butts is right. We are going to need to do it. But I think we do that anyway. <coughs> yeah, I've, I've done that where I've taught them something in year two and then had the same class in year five. And I know that they did it with me and the year three and the year four teacher. They're trying to tell them the same thing in year five. Yeah. And when you look at the key stage two writing check checklist for year six, there's nothing on it that's not taught in year three. No. So it is just that we expect more stamina and more kind of maturity, but it's the same purpose audience form. Lauren's got some good books there. That boy at the back of the class, amazing. There's, there's quite a focus as well at the moment, Mad, on, on um, God, what's the word I'm trying to think of? So I'll come back to it in a minute. It's gone. <laughs> well while you I, I some a couple of people have mentioned human clients oh, yeah, and and I I'm, I'm uh I don't know I must be a bit out of the loop mad did you know what a human client is I just saw it pop up before with with Martin Galway's name Yeah, yeah I don't know what I he had it up didn't he and said about getting children to stand in a scale of human clients Yeah and that's somebody actually, else yeah. That's that's the word that's the word <laughs> I'm going to show my ignorance here and say, obviously, Martin Galway needs to be, have his little picture on the screen here and tell us yeah. about it. Maybe he'll type it in. Come on, Martin. Um, uh, it, it came just after somebody, it, it was uh, L Butterworth 6 again, said, we use mood graphs and clines yeah, of that emotions it, yeah. for that after everyone was always dejected in stories. Um, so I, I get mood graphs. I've used mood graphs before, but I just didn't know what um, what a human cline was. <laughs> Well, Martin put it, didn't he, at Mr. Galway. He then typed something in. Generate words, go to the front, debate the order. Right. Oh, Thanks, right. Martin. Yeah. Thanks, Martin. Go. Can always count on Mr. Galway. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah obviously, I, Martin's got loads of blogs. I can imagine one of them will go into more detail with that. But um, I, th I think we can understand what he means by that. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. A human line, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen uh, John uh, John Murray do it as well. Uh, but it's a similar kind of thing. Shades of meaning, isn't it? And it's just about right. that discussion between uh, putting putting words into context. So, what is the difference between uh, be, being, uh, like you said, sad and being uh, dejected? That was it, Mads. That was the word I was trying to think of. Toria, obviously, I've spent a lot of time with Toria recently. And she knew that. <laughs> she can read your mind. <laughs> yeah, she can. So books, books on diversity. Books on diversity. Yeah. For any year group. Or... Well, I'm going into year five, so give me some year five on second. <laughs> well, well, I'd go boy at the back of the class, but right. I know I know a lot of people do it in year four. Um, wonder. I know that's already been up on the screen. The arrival, Sean Tan. Yeah, um, that's been up too. Good, good one. Yeah, yeah, that that the rabbit's book, the varmint's book. I mean, the red crayon. That's amazing. I know Andrew Moffat's got that in his um, in his No Outsiders in Our School. That's a red crayon that writes blue, and everybody tells me it needs to be red. So that that's really interesting. That can generate massive discussions about do you have to like stereotypes. Um, Put me on the spot here. I've got loads of <laughs> books in my head. Yeah, I think kids. I think kids. When when you open it up to kids, kids are quite happy to talk about diversity. Though we were playing twenty questions this week in a in a year three and four bubble, um, and they chose they chose a YouTuber. But one of the first questions that is is often asked when you're playing twenty questions is is it a girl or a boy? And this girl came over to me and said, "Can I tell you who it is?" And she told me who it is. She says, "But." I don't know what to answer because she's she's not they're not a girl or a boy they're trans but but for that for that kid it was just it was just the, the norm and i think for all uh, the, uh, people more mature like myself it, i think for for us it, it can sometimes feel like a, a big thing to talk about diversity like that but for kids it is 
there are yeah, so many so many diff di different people um available for, for for children to see um that it, it does just become the norm for people i i remember in my school when i was in primary school it was it was an all-white primary school and i remember meeting the the, the first kind of getting a, a friend in secondary school who was a, a person of color and it was it you know it was it was really strange um but nowadays because of the internet and they can see so much more it's just the norm for for most kids isn't it to see yeah. whether that's whether that's people people of color or whether it's lgbtq um it, it, they, they just see so many different um different things that for, for them it's the norm and sometimes the issue about talking about it isn't with the kids it's it's with the adults yeah and 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 i think the books that you choose can be they, they can be a scaffold for the for the adults to to uh uh, to, to structure the discussion around as well yeah those um those little people big dreams books if people have yeah. them they're, they're stunning and um and they some real characters so i know that they've got um bruce lee muhammad ali they've got some you know sports people from they've got that, that lady wilmer the one who had polio and was a sprinter they've got some fantastic books but they've got vivian westwood they've got bowie they've got bob dylan they've got Pele. You know, and it's just basically not saying that we've got here's a Black History Month book, but actually just yeah. here's lots of scientists. Yeah. And, and they're all different people, so they don't, exactly what you're saying, not a token gesture for October, but actually yeah. something that's always around. Yeah. Uh, somebody put no ballet shoes in Syria up, so upper key stage two, five or six, it's stunning. Um, it's set in Manchester, but it's beautifully written and it's got like a, a really strong voice. It's got a female lead as well, which is nice to see. Yeah, and th that's one of the things that we've been looking at during lockdown is what what you said before, didn't you, about your, your literary diet for your children. And especially with uh, what's happened over recent weeks, it's really kind of focused us and given us, you know, lockdown's been a terrible time for lots of people. But one of the silver linings for me is that it's been given, it's given some of our subject leaders time to actually think about what it is that we teach uh, and our English leaders has looked and, and and had a look at what do we give to our children what is the the, the the diet that we offer them is it diverse are they you know equal numbers of male and female role models um, is there any diversity and I know in our school um, we need to work really hard to, to get that diversity in there um, because there isn't that diversity within our school population and I think doing it through books is a is is a really strong way of of, of showing those um, positive role models. Because if you don't see yourself in those positions, then you're not going to think that you you can aspire to them. Um, so I think that's really important. And I really like the uh, the live comments. I think since we started talking about the books, people have just come alive and and, and written loads of uh, loads of, uh, of different comments. suggestions in the live comments as well. And I would. I was just going to say, um, don't underestimate, like just for everybody, if people are thinking that their uh, poetry um, is on the scale of the shops, their poetry isn't Waitrose, um, don't forget the, um, the, the, the purpose of song lyrics. Because actually I think somebody put up about books to manage emotions. I think song lyrics will, um, will really do that. I know the big read for BBC next week is... Liam Payne and Mabel and them sing, reading their song lyrics aloud. I think there's going to be something really powerful about that. And I think if people are struggling, get a song that might capture what you're trying to get the children to, to infer. Yeah. What are the song lyrics for um for the, the walk on tune, your fight tune then? Gas. <laughs> Mine, mine's just instrumental, G. It's it's, it's, it's a it's a glass it smashing. Oh. It's a glass smashing, and then it's just uh, it's just heavy, heavy, you know, metal guitar riffs uh, yeah. for a couple of minutes. That's that's it. Um, it's, it's, I know Mr. A, B, Mr. A, C, and D. They do some really good stuff around song lyrics, don't they? They are powerful, and kids kids like that because they think it's quite cool, don't they? Yeah. Plus too. they already plus they already know them. If you choose the right song, they already know wow. them. So yeah, you don't have to. Club Tropicana. Well, 
<laughs> Maybe not those ones. <laughs> as as mentioned, see, I, see, somebody's with me. T Gray Primary, Austin three sixteen, absolutely. Um, but um, Mr. D, Mr. AC and D said this is me is a great song to study. Um, yeah. But before before they even read it, even your poorest readers are. I don't well. I don't know whether, whether it's the same in your school, but that's a, a song that we that we've sung at school, and kids are familiar with it. So before they, they even read it, you say that we're going to do about this is me, and even your poorest readers can know what it's about and know the know the words already. So they're not they're not struggling to read the words before they're actually looking for the meaning as well. And you said yeah. before didn't you, about having that fluency before. Yeah. That teacher that's just flashed up there, he, I work with her at a school in Liverpool. They were doing the Highwayman. I hope she doesn't mind me saying, but I'm going to say it. They were doing the Highwayman, and for Bess and the Highwayman, she did Love Will Tear Us Apart. Oh, yeah, nice. I think just stuff like that. Um, when we were doing Macbeth, I know that I used all Queen songs. So we had Killer Queen. We had um, We Are The Champions. We had Another One Bites The Dust. We had Don't Stop Me Now, all for different points of the play. Um, and I think that just kind of supports the if, you, if they're dealing with a, an issue like Romeo and Juliet or the end of Romeo and Juliet or the end of Macbeth, we did um, Don't Look Back in Anger. And saying, you know, would would Lord Capulet look back in anger or has he got any regret? You know, it's just a context, isn't it, for them? Yeah, it's brilliant. We, yeah, we. I mean, of course, as we do Romeo and Juliet, you've got the dire straight classic, haven't you? Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Do you know that one, Gaz? I, I don't know that one, Graham. You, you, you've reached the edge of my my knowledge. Uh, I, I'm, on, I'm a little bit younger. I'm a little oh, bit younger than you, pal. I know that one. The Killers. The Killers cover it as well when they do their set with a love struck Romeo. Oh, <laughs> we're getting a demo. <laughs> <laughs> how does it go? How does it go, Graham? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll look it up after this. I'm yeah, sure I'll, I'll. I'm sure I'll know it when I hear it properly. Have yeah, you still well. got any viewers? It's a tune. Uh, Eighty-six. <laughs> <laughs> they, they've tuned in especially to hear Graham uh, and he's singing. <laughs> so, Graham, you're getting this mixed up with Ed Finch on a Sunday night. Yeah, true. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, I think that's a, a nice way to uh, wrap it up there. Uh, so, uh, Maddie, uh, you're an absolute star. Thank you for giving up an hour and sharing uh, sharing this with us. Um, as we have said, uh, it will be uh, it has been recorded. So, thank you, Graham, uh, and it will be posted on uh, on our uh, Twitter uh, feed for the YouTube link. Um, Maddie, you've been amazing. Um, as I said, I, I haven't been disappointed any time that I see you. And one of the best things about watching you is that you always come up with something new and fresh and um, and, and they're always new ideas. So thank you very much, Maddie. Uh, and Graham, once again, tremendous. Uh, your your tech skills, I mean, they are second to none. Uh, the, the, the very fact that we got that PowerPoint going and Maddie, Maddie spoke and could, could see everything yeah. is just sheer genius. I, I yeah, bow down to your, at the altar of your tech abilities, pal. I've learned a lot during lockdown. You certainly have, and it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, so, so, you're thinking of doing this as, as a regular thing, is that right, Gaz? Maybe it once could a month? be if we uh, if we uh, get the get get people as uh, the same kind of quality as as Maddie here. I, I think yeah. that this has been uh, absolutely fantastic. So, um, yeah, thank if we if we can, we will do. Thank yeah. you for letting me share the screen with you both. Now, Maddie, you've got um, you, you are at Moon Maddie on Twitter. Yeah. Do you have a website where people can go and book you in for um, CPD? Yeah, it's it's the first slide. So when when we put the slides on the websites on there. Yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. Okay, um, I, and like I say, Maddie, uh, she's one of these uh, these consultants who doesn't just come and it's one bam, thank you, ma'am. Here's me CPD. She does work very closely with schools, don't you? That that's right, Maddie, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that uh, it, it's normal, aren't we? Just normal people, just normal people. Right, thank you, you two. And th thank to you. everyone who's joined in, I hope that's been useful for you. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.